analysis with over 70 years combined experience. This is the Bob Ryan and Jeff Goodman podcast. NBA, some college, a little bit of everything. You know what I say, but it wasn't going to happen here with him. Hey, it's that time again. It's time for Bob Ryan, Jeff Goodman, tagging along for the ride Zoom with Pod. Jeff, as we know, is deep into the NCAA season. <laughs> we will see him someday soon. Our prize picks, our exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with prize picks. Okay, Bob, Rajon Rondo. Boy, what a career, what a character. So much to talk about. After two years of not playing, he has finally called it quits. Where do you want to begin on Rajon Rondo? You go, start with Doc's insistence when he was here that, and I, that quote, Rondo's the smartest player I've ever coached, unquote. Right. We, we all rolled our eyes. And I still kind of do. He was an interesting, it's just interesting observation from Doc, all right? Rondo was a very specifically interesting special player. Uh, one of the two greatest 6-1 rebounders in NBA history, the other being Fat Lever. And this enabled him to appear among the all-time leaders in triple doubles. He is number 16 on the all-time list, which which is, I'm talking about, which is current, including active players such as Jokic and 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 uh, uh, Doncic, um, he was electrifying in his peak here. He was he was a, a, a such a special ingredient in those with those great teams with the big three. Um, I remember right from the start there, his first year in 06, 07, he was playing behind Sebastian Telfair, and every time he get in, the game would be lit up. Mm. It, it, it it was different. And, with, and you know, I'm sitting there thinking, I want to see more of this kid. And it only took one year. The next year, he is the quarterback of a championship team. And every a very important component on those teams. And uh, the little brother, though, I, I will always forever think of him as a kid. And he's 38 years old now, you know. And uh, no. by the way, he's been retired for two years. He's only officially announced his retirement. Of it, but is, um, hadn't played in the league in two years. But now he's officially done. Um, did you know? that after leaving the Celtics, he played for no fewer than eight teams, including the Lakers twice. Now, I knew he had bounced around, but I did not know it was that peripatetic, as we say. Uh, anyway, um, he was a special player. Uh, he he wasn't a great outside shooter. He could make one every once, every once in a while. He'd, he'd, he'd get a little streak. But what an extraordinary ability to go to the basket. And, of course, he is a three-time assist leader. In the league, he led the league in assists three times, led the league in steals once. Uh, uh, it was he, four All Star games. Uh, it's, it's not a Hall of Famer, but there, but in the Celtic lore, uh, he occupies a special place. There was nobody quite like him, you know, stylistically, which is true. A lot of guys, the, 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 but you just you you don't. I don't know in the league you compare him to now. And and the only other guy you could have compared him to at the time was Fat Lieber, but Fat Lieber didn't have the the flair that the Doc that uh, Rondo had. Um, it, it, you look at some of the numbers he put up. You know, you, it, time goes on, you forget some of the playoff game numbers he put up with with with, with not not just 13, 10, 11 kind of triple doubles. We're talking 28, 17, you know, thirteen kind of stuff. And uh, it, it was a it was a but but he, he was headstrong. And you know what happened in Dallas? He goes to Dallas, and he and he and he butts heads with Rick Carlisle, who's the coach, and he gets benched. And I'm going to get the details just so I don't misspeak here. And in the playoffs, he was benched after Game Two of the first round. He didn't play as they lost in five, at the rest of the series, and reportedly was not voted a playoff share by his teammates. Now that's a unconfirmed, but it's out there reportedly i say with and and that didn't end well at all and from there on he went from uh dallas to sacramento chicago new orleans the lakers atlanta clippers cleveland and sticked another time back in with the lakers i'm but uh it, 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 it in the summation is he, he made a valuable contribution to a championship team and we know that team could have won three in a row and as he he was very much a part of that it's a shame you know that 
it didn't end the way it should have here. But based on the way he bounced around after that, apparently everybody got tired of him quickly. And, he was a, he and was, that was his own fault. He was a basketball genius. Well, Doc yeah. would certainly agree with you. When it comes to genius, <laughs> when it comes to genius, there's complications with that. Now, I don't know his Mensa score. I don't know if I can officially say he was a genius. Yeah. yeah. But with the genius ability on the floor, I believe comes complications. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with Rondo the moment I saw him play. And we had him in the studio and we talked to him. And I remember at, up at Comcast Sportsnet, we all started to talk because we started to see the same thing you did. And we said, this guy's the guy. We started to see it, you know, because mm -hmm. we we're coming to Celtics. We were there all the time. Donnie Marshall would see him in practice. We said, this is the guy. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, very conversational, very easy to deal with. But as time went on, that changed. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a story. It was during the... I can't remember if it was the OA championship or the 2010. No, it was the OA championship. We were at we were in um at the Beverly uh at the Beverly Hill at the team hotel, whichever one, the Wilshire in Los the Angeles. Wilshire. Okay, the I was Wilshire. with my wife. And what a day, Sidney Portier walks by. And you know me <laughs> being a movie buff, and I'm sure you feel the same way. It's like, oh my God, that's Sidney Portier. You know, everybody's yeah. looking for the Celtics. And I'm like, my God, that's Sidney Portier. <laughs> And I said hello to him, Mr. Portier. And then Perk came walking by. I was like, hey, Perk, what's up? And they had lost that game. Maybe maybe that was game three. And I said, what have you been doing? He says, Rondo and I were up watching the game till 4 a.m. Perk was really Rondo's rock. Uh, uh. When Perk left, my observation, mm -hmm. something was missing for Rajan. And as we came to learn, when Perk left, a lot was missing emotionally with that team. Mm -hmm. Perk was very important to that locker room. He was very important to Rajan Rondo. He was able to keep Rondo in line, if you will. Ah. Because, because, and then when Garnett left and Pierce left, that's when Rondo kind of lost his way. And there was no anchor for Rajan. Mm -hmm. I always felt very sympathetic towards him because, I mean, I observed him a lot. I mean, I was there. I watched mm -hmm. the guy. And this is these are only my observations. And I just felt like he was searching for something. He was looking for something. I felt bad for him. Some people became irritated with him. But I saw a kid that needed, he just needed something. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't find it after that team left especially after Perk left. Mm -hmm. And he was never able to find it again. And I really felt bad about that because that led to the behavior we're talking about. Well, and this is the genius part of him. I believe that Rajon Rondo was probably the worst shooter that could control a floor in the history of the league. <laughs> that's, a good, that's very good. He really could, Bob. I mean, it was amazing. He, was, he could control the other nine guys while having a shot. And I felt he could have been the worst shooter and ever make the Hall of Fame if he had continued on the path. Yeah. Um, I loved watching him, but boy, when he was on, he was something. But when he was off, and I was there with this when he was off, you know, he had some off the record, I can't say, but, you know, he had some moments behind the scenes, yeah. with the coaching staff after, and he lost his way. And it's just a damn shame. I think it's one of the all-time shames of the league. Uh, because as you you just eloquently said so well, he was a master to watch. He really was. Without a jump shot. You so, know, his observations, I'm curious to get, and that's Brian Scalabrini. He was a teammate on that. Right. Now I'm sure he'll be heard from. Uh, sadly, you know, he's went up with legal troubles the last couple of years. I won't go into the details. Right, so right. Yeah, because we don't. Anybody wants to Google it, you can Google right. it. He's had uh, some troubles. To, yes, I don't want to dump on him at all, in uh, in that regard, it's, but there's facts, you know. But it's a it's a special career. I mean, it is a unique career. There's it's he's an it, enigma. His really. style of play, uh, but boy, at his peak, 
it was it was a joy to watch. It was it yeah, was he a, really was. I mean, he was something was. else with that with that group. And by yeah. the way, he he is the all time Celtic playoff assist leader, more uh, surpassing Bob Cousy. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so um, he should always be remembered. You know, when when the discussions of prominent Celtics come up, I, I we will make sure we we include. Rajon Rondo. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is so easy to play. I can make my Celtic picks and make my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Celtics and NBA fans, you can get in on prize picks in 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. On prize picks this week, I'm selecting Jason Tatum to dish out more than five assists and his teammate Jalen Brown to have more than 22 and a half points. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy, prize picks. Moving on to the big story uh, of the week. It's yes. the NCAA as Caitlin Clark in Iowa advances to take on UConn. And wouldn't it be just like Gino Oriema to spoil the party and come out of nowhere? But let's well, first I, talk about the LSU-Iowa matchup and her 41 points in that game. Well, she started off immediately making a three and, and getting her attention. Uh, it was a masterpiece game. Uh, she, she's at 41 points, 12 assists. Um uh, we're used to those pull up. She pulls up really. They, when you when she crosses mid court, you better get your hands up. You better get it. I mean, it's it's, it's Steph Curry. It's the female Steph Curry. Her her range is Steph, and it's legitimately Steph Curry range. We're not talking about some some scaled down version of basketball. Fact of the matter is, it's ninety four by fifty. We'll get into that controversy about the three point lane and the women's and all that nonsense in a minute. But but um, she pulls up what they call the logo shot now, you know, and apparently now in Iowa at Carver Hawkeye arena, they've got a marker now where she made the basket that broke the record, which was from about 30 feet. So anyway, um, it was a virtuoso performance when most needed in a, an important game. Uh, but they did have the help that the auxiliary help she needed other Kate Martin and, and, and others stepped up and, and had good games. Uh, as we, as we learned the name, as we learned this team to see more, I've seen this team play now. How many, how many times this year? You know, so it's amazing. I I I exed yesterday, by the way, Garrett. I have had more casual conversations about women's basketball in the last week, just moving around town, than I've had in the last fifty years combined. I mean, it's you, you go into this. I I went. To, you go into a store. Hey, did you see the game? You go into the deli counter. Hey, did you see the game? Yeah. And that game was the game was the Iowa. You. The, it turns out it was the most watched women's game ever. Twelve million people, and. Um, uh, it, it, it was and it was a high high level game, and uh, now one thing I must give full credit. I mean, so uh, there was an asterisk attached. Angel Reese uh, got hurt. She gutsed it out and came back, but uh, she was two for twelve after she came back, and uh, and uh, she still got her share of rebounds. Why she had nineteen rebounds? Uh, she's very good, strong inside presence. And you don't know it at full strength, you know how she would have played, and but. That's a shame. I feel bad about, you know, I hate, I hate that, what I call the loose ends. It's kind of a loose end in that game that, you know, right. what would have happened if Angel had stayed in. Anyway, um, it was a high level game and it was a, uh, it was an excellent basketball game. And uh, can, Caitlin, the thing, the, the, the caravan, the circus, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the show moves on. Now it moves on to Cleveland and the semifinal game, which is what we would like to, we wish were the championship game, frankly, you know, uh, is going to be, UConn and and it's a different UConn team. Gino has never taken a team like this going back to 1995 when he had his first one a championship so battered and and he's only suiting up eight people apparently and 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 they the the starters get heavy minutes and it's and it's all about Paige Beckers now she's back after missing a whole season and the idea that these two glamour you know glamorous players are going to be battling uh one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh is, and it will be a subplot and they'll they will wind up guarding each other at times i'm certain and uh, it's going to be great to watch but uh page beckers is reminding everybody hey hey uh i was the best player in the two years ago and of course 
you know, and, and it, it's, it's, this is so good for women's basketball. You know, it just is. And it's not just those two, too. You know, we got, we, we got uh, uh, Juju Watkins out in SC, and, and we've got uh, Hannah Hidalgo at Notre Dame. We've got up and comers all over the place. So uh, that, that this sport is really booming. Does it continue with Caitlin leaving? Well, I hope so. I think that it's, <clears throat> I, 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 it's going to be interesting. I, but the attention is focused. And, and yeah, I, I think there's going to be some residual. But she's special. Of course, she's special. Um, but there's no reason why we can't have high level players. And well, right I think, I think, I think it will continue because of, and we've discussed this with Caitlin because of the ability to make money in the marketing yeah. with sports, you know, where yeah. you have, the, you know, commercials, films, movies, there's other ways for players in the women's game to be put out to the public. And I think that that's huge. You know, yeah. and I and I think that they they'll benefit from it greatly. And no kid, and there's something, Bob. You know, there's something about being a fan. About it's kind of lost a little bit. It's very hard. You know, I guess you could go back to like well, it's not really David Stern. You, it's it's to the point now in sports where you become a fan of the individual as opposed to the team mm. because of player movement. Certainly yeah. because of the men's game, the way players have moved in the portal and so forth. So you become a fan, of, you, you know, in, in the college game, you still, you'll look at Caitlin Clark, it's four years at Iowa, you know, yep. you've had a chance, you have a bond, you know, I'm a, I'm a Hawkeye fan, that's it, I'm, you know, I'm with this team, or I'm a UConn fan, and in college basketball, you just don't have that for men, Yeah, and... Well, you know, you have it. You have it with the NFL because player movement isn't as, you know, like yeah. Patrick Mahomes isn't going anywhere. Yeah, I just think it's one of the benefits of following NCAA women's basketball is if you fall in love with, if you like a player, they're yeah. going to be there a while. I mean, there are transfers, but it's not at the level of the men's. And, and, and you're absolutely right. And and in this case, this is the ultimate example of it. And and uh, uh, in both cases, of both uh, Caitlin Clark and and Paige Beckers. Uh, no, it's great. So this is a, a this is a big moment in women, not just bat, women's college basketball <clears throat> in history, but women's sports history in general. The, the tension's being focused. As I said, uh, uh, it's just amusing to think these conversations that I just alluded to a few minutes ago were not possible even two years ago, let alone ten or twenty or thirty. You know, it just weren't. And um, and so. And I, I, I've had fun in, in next to uh, I, I, with people sparring with people about about this and and uh, and pointing out that though these players are great and we love them, that I still have not seen a better pure point guard in the women's game than Dawn Staley herself. And I and I know I have not seen a better post player than Lisa Leslie. And as good as Angel Reese is, uh, she would benefit by taking some lessons from Lisa Leslie. She's a great rebounder, but she's she, you know she's not the scorer that Lisa Leslie was. And I just want people to remember these players that have existed and everybody's saying uh, Cheryl Miller. Yes, of course, Cheryl Miller. Dinah Taurasi was still with us, you know, and all that. Sue Bird, yeah, better than Dawn Staley. And I'm saying, we're having arguments about women's basketball? How great is that? Right, right. I mean, that's the coolest thing that that, that, that we were having these discussions. So uh, this is a just a great time and I just hope they can take proper advantage of, of what's happening. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it translates to the WNBA. Oh, well, bingo. Because thus far, it flies so far under the radar. You know, people can't tell you who won the championship. I forget who won the championship. And it's off season, and, though, too, right? I Las mean, Vegas, uh, I think. But but uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's off and it's competing with baseball and football, which never goes away now. You know, right. as, as football was 12 months a year. We're getting ready for the OTAs, followed by the mini camp, followed by training camp. It ain't that far away, folks. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, uh, the draft first, the draft, which is uh, the, one of the great conversational topics in, in American sport oh, now. It's okay. becoming Do they trade draft. number three or not? Yeah. Oh, my God. Come on. And we got a lot. This taste, we still have two weeks to go. Plus, before that draft takes place, it's, it's, we're over two weeks away. And but the, it's been the dominant part topic of conversation for two months already. And it's got another couple of weeks to go anyway. So, yeah, the WNBA, that's uh, what will it translate into that? We'll, oh, we'll, we'll see. see. You know, we'll see. Uh, we lost a a very important person yeah. in Boston sports history and Larry Lucchino. I really liked Larry. 
Uh, I did not have battles with Larry. Like I, I'm waiting when Dan feels better. I'm I'm waiting to see if Shaughnessy. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have something to say because Larry was the he was the best. It, and I just want to start by saying when these carpetbaggers first came in to buy the <laughs> Red Sox, you know we were all we were apoplectic. There I mean, were air quotes on. on that line, folks. Air quotes. Okay, go ahead. They were what? Air quotes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Air quotes. Folks, there were air quotes in that line. Yeah. Air okay. quotes. I just air want quotes. you to know that. Okay. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yes, thank you good for the podcast. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, Werner was a Hollywood guy. Larry was out with the Padres. You know, John Henry had owned the Marlins. What are they doing? Coming in buying the Red Sox. You can make the statement that off the field, Larry Lucchino was the best thing that ever happened to the Boston Red Sox. Well, in the 21st century, that's for sure, if it's starting with the ballpark, but also starting with importing uh, a young lad, a young whippersnapper, uh, up and coming executive named Theo Epstein, because that's he is Theo is his protege. And 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 he brought him in from San Diego and hired him out there to start with the Yale kid. Um, absolutely. Larry Lucchino, uh, first of all, was an athlete. He was a standout high school baseball player and a standout high school basketball player who was the backup point guard on the 1965 NCAA uh, third place team, uh, Princeton University, uh, Bill Bradley's team. Um, he, was, he was already Highlands backup. Uh, he was an attorney, a graduate of Yale Law. His entree was he was hired by the law firm in Washington, headed by the legendary Edward Bennett Williams, about whose autobiography, and his biography is entitled the man to see. He was the power broker of the whole Democratic Party establishment and, and, and in the downtown in Washington. And he was became very much Edward Williams, Bennett Williams' protege. And when Edward Bennett Williams bought into the Redskins, uh, he, Larry got his entree into professional sport. So he, he now is the only person in the world who, that had an NFL championship ring a major, a baseball championship ring and a, and a final four watch or ring, whatever they give them. Okay. Uh, then when Edward Bay Williams went, bought the Orioles or got, you know, he brought Larry with him and, and that's how that was Larry's entry into baseball. And you know, from then on, he went to San Diego and to Boston. Um, he was a visionary. And, and one of the visions he had was what a ballpark should look like. And Camden Yards was a revolutionary park that was uh, the, 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 the first of the new wave of ballparks was, was built. And and he had, however, he knew, had the foresight to hire this uh, woman architect, which I shouldn't uh, name Janet Marie Smith, uh, who should be in the Hall of Fame herself, by the way. I'm not, I'm hardly alone in saying that, um, to, to design this new ballpark. And it, it was revolutionary and, and it changed the whole idea of how bar, what ballpark construction would be for the rest of the time. And that's how he, he made his initial name there. But uh, uh, he was, uh, there's all kinds of great stuff out, out there for him now. You got to read it. Uh, uh, tough negotiator, but a very witty, charming guy. Uh, but uh, 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 driven, yes. But but uh, uh, he, he just got it, folks. He just got it, and and uh, uh, he proved it in three different places. And and he and four of you go to Worcester with the you know. The, oh, they, the, they did a great stuff. job. I mean, and that moved... ballpark, by the way, once again is a is a is a state of the art treasure. That new polar park right it's a wonderful place to go to a baseball game from dan shaughnessy's book with tito francona which if by the way if anybody hasn't read it you, it's a must read um after the red sox reverse the curse and they win the world series right mm -hmm. and they're going to have the whole thing at fenway park and tito is terry francona is like sky high larry comes coming in with a box of sweatshirts tito you gotta <laughs> have the players wear their sweatshirts or selling them online, right? <laughs> you know, that type of thing, which is, you know, that was Larry's the business guy. Business. Business. This is it. This is a cash flow. And, and Terry's like, God, Larry, but come on, man. Your world, it said 2004 World Series champs, Boston Red Sox. I want every player wearing them. I want them out there. You know, <laughs> we got to sell these things. <clears throat> and like Frank Oda was like, I don't want to deal with this, but I never thought you could make Fenway an attraction the way they have it's amazing from the bleacher seats to the right field 
Now, the seats are always going to be small. That's just the way it is. Yep. But what they what Larry did with that ballpark was it was amazing. You know, it's amazing. The theme, Larry and Janet Marie Smith, once again, she executed this. And, and she, there, there, I remember Larry, his mantra was do no harm, do no harm. Make sure that whatever you do, you do no harm. Right. I was, I objected to the uh, monster seats, thought it was silly. You know, I still think, by the way, people, if they want to sit there, fine. It's a glorified beacher seat, but you're sitting over the wall and that matters to people because I'm sitting over the wall, period. But it's, you know, the, but I've it's like, kind of a bucket list thing, Bob. Believe it yeah. or not, it's a I know. bucket well, list thing. Funny, the first year of the seats, they had no idea what to charge. They didn't know it was going to be as popular as it, as it was. Yeah. I think they were like fifteen bucks or something. You know, I don't know what they are now, but you get charged by the tier, first row, second row, third yeah. row, right? Yeah. Anyway, but I was I was wrong, totally wrong. Right? Why? It, it it was an instant hit, and that was Larry, Larry wanted that. Um, uh, uh, there's so many specifics we could we could you know go into with the things, he, but you know he butted heads with people. He butted head Theo Theo and his protege. They wound up having a dispute. Theo he left, but he did come back, and then they had six years of of, of I would say uh, you know, getting along rather than you know. Well, you know, Larry also realized, and I think this is I don't know if it's part of the debate with baseball today. Larry realized that, yes, you had the sabermetrics and, you know, definitely the 07 team was more of a Theo personality than the 04 team. But Larry realized you had to spend some money. We had to get some names in here. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to, we had, you know, so it was a combination of, you know, the, well, Ortiz wasn't that, that kind of fell into their lap, but, you know, you needed the big names too. You needed the Manny Ramirez and the Ortiz and the Becketts to go along with the Papelbons and Lester's who eventually became stars, yeah. you know? So yeah. that's what I remember about Larry was, you know, we still need to give peace and we need to some big names here to give people a reason to come to the ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. This, that, uh, he, he, he just got that. He got it all there. And, and, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Maybe the one, the one swing in the miss was probably Bobby Valentin, Bobby Valentine. Yeah. That was a mistake. That didn't that was, work. No, no question that, that, that was terrible. Um, we love he's the man who memorably uh, labeled our competitors down to the right. south as the evil empire terrific which which drove steinbrenner steinbrenner hated him. they that that was great that was, he made a wonderful enemy in george steinbrenner now i note that among the tributes that he's received in uh, today is from randy, randy levine of the yankees who who cited uh, uh commended larry as a very worthy adversary and en enjoyed the competition you know with larry he had the front three to Play, you know, make play the Red Sox on a level with the Yankees, uh, and, and and so in the 21st century they've been better than the Yankees overall. So yeah, um, it, it the, the tributes are going to be coming from from everywhere. Yeah, he was brilliant. I mean, I thought he was going to be commissioner at one point, but maybe I don't know. He might have been too opinionated to be commissioner. But you know, Larry was like he was a PT Barnum because it took somebody from Baltimore. <laughs> to call the Yankees the evil empire. Yeah. You know, we were, I mean, think about it, Bob. I, I I mean, you're a Bostonian. You came here, you went to BC. I mean, I lived here all my life. You've been here for pretty much all your life. We, we had this inferiority complex with the Yankees. Oh, yeah. I mean, just couldn't get over it. Sure. You know, just could And here this guy comes in from Baltimore slash San Diego and he's the guy to call him the evil empire and finally stand up to him and is part of the reason that we finally beat the Yankees. It's crazy. The evil empire thing is great. I mean, that's, that, that, I, I that's legendary. I, I got to tell you. That's yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah. A little story. So when I had a podcast of my own Bob Ryan, Boston podcast, uh, a number of years ago, that 2017 to be precise in 18, um, I had Larry Latino one day. And it was down at the Boston Public Library. And in preparation for it, I wanted to, uh, uh, I started off by uh, referencing the 1965 Providence Princeton game in the Eastern Regional Final. Final score Princeton 109, Providence 69. And of course, as a BC guy, I hated Providence at the time and feared them. And, and, uh, uh, and I, Larry was on that team, of course. So I started off by uh, red, red, you know, re referencing that, 
bringing a, getting the interview off to a wonderful start. He was at, he was so happy beaming about that one. We got off to that, you know. So um, that that's all. It, it's it's available out there, folks. So you can go you can go find it. The Bob Ryan Boston Podcast with, with Larry Lucchino. It was fun. I'm I'm proud of that. <laughs> yeah, he feared no one. He really did. Very important. Very important. Like the bat. I mean. Our old friend Jerry Callahan, he'd have battles with Dennis and Callahan on the on the you know the radio show. Yeah, he didn't back down from anybody. Very, yeah. very, very, like you said, brought in Theo. I mean, uh changed the culture. Changed the culture here in Boston. All right, Robert, anything else on your mind? Well, yeah, we got a very, uh, as we speak, uh, uh, we are speaking on a, on a Wednesday morning at the moment, and there, there was a very interesting game, uh, the Celtics, finally back home after a six-game road trip. And they're playing the Oklahoma City Thunder, who are in a torrid Western Conference race. They are tied with Minnesota two games behind uh, right. the Denver Nuggets. And uh, um, this is a visit bringing MVP candidate Shea Gillis, Gilgis Alexander to us and SGA, as he's popularly known. And uh, we're going to be the bot. We're going to get to look at Chet Holmgren, you know, and uh, who is. Uh, uh, falling a bit behind Victor Wembiana in the Rookie of the Year thing now, after he was definitely in the lead at Thanksgiving or at Christmas anyway, but uh, giving us a solid 16.7 rebounds, three assists uh, game. The the uh, the the string bean from uh, the state of Minnesota, and uh, so uh, it's going to be a game I'm looking forward to, and uh, to see you know how they're going to react and how the Celtics are going to react. But it's it's good that this franchise. Uh, which still, in my opinion, ought to be in Seattle, but that's not, that's another story. It's been well received by the people. They did, they, 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 and, and I, I'm, I'm happy for the Oklahoma City fan. They, they've been greatly supportive of this franchise, and, and, and I hope they're enjoying the season this team is giving them. Well, I don't know, Bob. I just thought of this with the Celtics. Do you think their confidence is shaken at all? I, no. Uh, I, I think they, I mean, I don't know for sure, but no, I, I don't. No, as an observer, I mean, you know. From... Yeah, I mean, no, I don't. I think they're, you know, the, I think the coach, uh, his attitude towards the, 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 these uh, two things, the big losses, I mean, the big lead blowns and the, and the uh, final not, two minutes. Final two minutes. Um, I, I think he thinks he's in control, and, and I think he's transmitted that. Yeah, but I, I don't think so. And I certainly don't think Jalen Brown has lost any confidence in any way. That's for sure, you know, and I wouldn't think that Holiday or or, or White or, or uh, and Jason shouldn't, you know, but the pressure's on Jason. You know, he's he's ultimately he's got to play an MVP level for them to to get the, this job done. Uh, I mean, all the time, not just, uh, you know, some of the time. So well, I don't think so. But uh, I think the guy there that can keep them honest is, is, is Jalen Brown. And I think he's he's an eternal, you know, fourth right person. So. Oh, well, that's all. I'm I'm not too worried about. It. And then his big brother, big brother Al. I'm glad to have him around too. Right, exactly. All right, Bob. Uh, enjoy Phoenix. Yes, thank you. I'm look uh, looking forward to it, of course. And uh, you know the, uh, uh, the, the just you know the the men's tournament. You know it's still going on too. You know, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, which everybody thinks it's UConn a foregone conclusion. So we'll see. Yeah. All right, Bob. Brought to you by Prize Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. Until next time, Bob Ryan and Gary. Oh.